Okay, so the topic of today is the residual neural networks, um, generalization error and parameterization. Um, presenting some joint work with uh, Akko Kamenen, Peter Preschak, Matthias Sandberg, Anders Pess and Raul Tempone. So just to set the sort of stage, um, I will focus on sort of supervised learning problem of function reconstruction using a deep neural network from observed data. Um, what does it mean? Well, let's assume that y is equal to f of x plus some noise term. Um, e. e and x are independent and the noise has zero mean and finite uh, variance. Um, x is some d-dimensional thing and y is single dimension. And what we observe, well, we observe a set of data points, x and y n. And what we're looking for is a neural network beta of x, so a function from rd to r that approximates f well. So nothing strange here. Um, okay, so one question that's sort of been around um, for quite some time in, in the deep learning community is to sort of understand where the success of deep neural network is coming from. Um, so we know that from all the sort of empirical work that's been done that um, most of the time deep networks outperform shallow networks, um, even if they have similar degrees of freedom. So in some sense they have the same complexity, but the deep networks still do better. And there has been a lot of studies devoted to this question and the answer um, they provide can very roughly be divided into two categories. So one is the category of, okay, well, deep networks are good because they are easy to, easy to train. It's not that they are better as, you know, it's not that the optimal function would be better, it's just that it's much easier to find a, a good approximator using deep networks. The second answer is the, is the other one. So that's like, well, actually deep networks are better at uh, approximating these complicated functions. So they are better at approximating the functions that we care about in practice or some version of that uh, answer. Um, and we know from the work of Barron in already 93, so 30 years ago, that the sort of shallow network, so by shallow I mean one hidden layer, that they are basically good enough. So in theory, a, a big enough shallow network can approximate any function. Um, okay, so let's look at some, let me just mention a few um, I think quite nice papers. Model compression from from 06 and uh, do deep nets really need to be deep from 14. Um, they were both written by Caruana and, and sort of co-workers. Um, and what he and what they are doing here is something called model compression. So they start off with a very big, very deep neural network. They train it as well as they can on the training data. And then what they do is that they, they generate new data where the target, so the new Y is the output of the, the deep complicated model. And then they try to reconstruct the deep network using a shallow network or a less deep network. Um, and what they show in these studies that actually for a lot of, for a lot of sort of quite uh, interesting examples, you can um, achieve almost the same accuracy using a small model, less deep than you could with a deep model. Um, so, so these really point to the former of the two um, categories here. So this one, that they're just sort of, in some sense, the deep networks are easier to train. Um, today, uh, one of the results I'll present um, shows something slightly differently. I, I, I will show that for at least a 
certain class of functions, deep residual networks are better than the shallow counterpart at approximating them. Um, so this is just to put the result into some sort of broader context. Um, okay, so where do the, so the, I'm not talking about any deep neural network today, I'm talking specifically about residual neural networks and they, are, they haven't been around for that long. I think they were um, defined um, by He and his co-workers. They were at Microsoft Labs at the time in 2015, 2016. So I think the, the paper was published in 2016, but in 2015, they really um, showed the world um, some really impressive results um, in image recognition using the residual networks. Um, so they quickly became popular um, in the years afterwards. Now, one issue that the community had been struggling with prior to the introduction of these deep residual networks was the was a sort of degradation of accuracy. So, what do I mean? Well, I mean that so for some time. It, it looked like just making the network a bit deeper um, made the resulting, you know, made the result better. But that held up to a point, and then after a while, as the networks got even deeper, the accuracy saturated, and then it started degrading. Um, so actually, at some point, after some point, the the quality of the fits that people got actually got worse and worse the deeper they made the network. And this is not, um, interestingly enough, this is not um, just caused by overfitting, which one might assume. So really what is happening here is that even on the training error, uh, you could see this degradation, which is interesting. I mean, you're making the, comp you're making the, um, the network more and more complicated and you will sort of assume that okay, yes, you're making it super complicated so you can approximate the training error, uh, the training data perfectly, but then it generalizes poorly. But that was not what was happening. And the sort of deep, what they showed in this, uh, with their work is that actually if you use these deep residual networks, um, you avoid this degradation issue. So what then is a residual neural network? So a basic building block of a residual network is a weight layer followed by some nonlinear mapping, for instance, a ReLU, uh, and then another weight layer. And then you couple this with a connection from the input. So I think it's best explained by this little picture here. So you see data coming in, X. It's mapped through a weight layer, nonlinear function, and weight layer, so that this this, this little bit here would be just a standard piece of a deep neural network. What's new here is that you have this so-called skip connection that goes and skips the um, non-linearities happening here. And then what you end up with is just the input plus this standard mapping. And then they connect this um, together to form these uh, quite deep networks. So this is from the original paper. And they have something like 34 layers, which at the time was considered very deep. Um, and you can see these skip connections really go all the way, all the way through the network. So that at the end, you still have access to the input you had here. So as they say in their paper, it should be easy to train the identity function. That was that seems to have been one of the sort of guiding principles for these guys. Um, okay, so that's a, a little bit of a look at what could be behind this success of the residual networks. Now, okay, so it turns out that in a certain way, residual networks can be regarded as a discrete approximation of an ODE. 
So that's quite nice. All of a sudden you go from this horribly complicated um, thing, which is just a standard deep neural network to an OD. So as a mathematician, that sort of brings you some degree of comfort. Um, okay, so how is that done? Um, well, I think you can do it in many different ways, but let me outline one, one way. So let's have a residual network with an activation function denoted by sigma. We can write it down like this. So x is the input. And then really here is the uh, thing that makes it a residual network. So each recursively, each layer in the network has access to the previous layer plus some nonlinear mapping of the previous layer. Okay, so this is, if you remember the graph I showed you before, this is the input to the block, and then you have a weight applied to it, some nonlinear mapping, another weight layer, and then you add back the input. And the output of the network is just, well, the final layer multiplied by some uh, um, weight, set of weights to scale it into the right dimension. Um, okay, it's, so let's, so, so how can we make this sort of into something continuous? Well, let's assume that these u and w, so the weights of each layer, are just random variables. IID sample from some probability distribution rho. When you do that, you no longer need to care about how to get hold of the weights. They're just there. And we can let the number of layers tend to infinity. Okay, so then let's look at this ODE. Said um, at the start, given by the input, B times X, and then the uh, dynamics is just governed by derivative of Z with respect to T is just the expected value. Um, okay, so you can see that in some sense it looks a lot like what we had here. If you let L, if you let L grow, and in fact, what Vein on Earth and his uh, his co-workers proved. So I'm following here a paper called uh, Barron Spaces and Composition and Function Spaces um, from 29, uh, 2019 that he's written. Uh, many more in, in sort of similar similar vein is that actually if you let the number of layers tend to infinity then the set as defined here um, is what you get so under some conditions on the uh, on the weights and the distribution of weight this ODE actually has a unique solution and it is the solution you get when you let L tend to infinity. And in fact, you even have a uniform convergence. Um, so that's sort of, in some sense, quite nice. It gives you a sense of how, um, what these networks actually, they actually are. Um, and just a small note here before I move on, actually, so in this example, the distribution raw, um, okay, is gone. But the, the distribution of the parameters uh, was constant in time. But typically, you want the distribution to vary in time, and then you sort of wonder what what happens. And in fact, you can you can extend the, the previous result to this case as well. Um, you get a very similar looking similar looking result. Um, so basically, if you have, even if you have a time dependent family of distributions under some sort of similar, similar conditions, um, plus some Lipschitz like condition on the distribution, you, you get a uniform convergence of, of the neural network to the ODE solution. 
Okay, so again, this sort of results indicate that we can view these networks as discrete approximations to, to a continuous system of all these. Um, and the sort of a natural follow up question then is well, can this insight somehow shed light on the approximation capacity of the neural network? For instance, what happened, and also can we sort of pick the distribution of the parameters in some optimal way to achieve the best possible uh, neural network? So that, that is really what uh, one of the main topics of today. Um, and I will get back to this point in a couple of slides. But first, I'd like to take a slightly different look at the, the residual networks. So again, this is sort of the continuous limit where we say, well, okay, let the number of layers tend to infinity. Let's see what you get. And you get an ODE. Um, but you can also see it as basically a boosted sequence of shallow networks. And then you don't need to go to any infinite limit. It's just the way it is. Uh, so what do I mean? What do I mean by boosted sequence of shallow networks? So let's take a step back and think about what boosting is. So boosting, um, boosting is a very popular technique in supervised learning. Um, it's used to construct, this is sort of copy pasted from the uh, Wikipedia page. So construct strong learners out of weak learners. Now, what that means sort of roughly is that, well, let's say that you have some fairly simple model that's way too simple to capture the complexity of the situation you're in. Um, through boosting, we can actually stack these weak learners up in some way. And then the resulting, uh, the resulting function or the resulting model is sort of complicated enough. Um, and the nice thing with this boosting is that it's actually, it's, it's typically quite simple. And if, if, you're, if the basic building block is sort of simple enough, you, um, you can quickly train them and you, you typically get uh, good, good results. So they're very popular in, in sort of online machine learning competitions, etc. But okay, let's just review what this means. So let's assume you have some training data, D, and let uh, B represent some training uh, algorithm. So you map your training data onto some function. Um, so B is supposed to represent this sort of weak learner. So think about any sort of simple nonlinear uh, model, for instance, a binomial tree. Now, let's assume here that this model B has the property of decreasing the training error. So at least for the training data, you decrease the variance. So Y minus the, uh, the train function is smaller than just Y. We will see uh, shortly why this is uh, important. Okay, so then how do we actually boost B? Well, we boost B by constructing a sequence of functions, B1, B2, B3, all the way up to Bk, trained on some uh, training set D, where the Ds uh, are defined. So D1 is just D, and then you define Dk as the training set of consisting of X, comma, the residual of what you've seen. So y minus the, um, the sum of all the functions you've trained so far. Okay. So remember, we started off with some training algorithm. So B, we can train, we can train given any training data. Okay. So all we've done here is that we've changed the training data. We're keeping the, the way we train the same. So then we can train 
on this new data set that we get a new function pk. So that's how you sort of successively construct the boosted, the sequence of uh, boosted functions. And the final, um, the final model is just the sum. Okay. Um, now, remember that B is decrease in the training error, which means that you start off with Y, so sum of Y squared, that's your sort of starting, starting error. You train it once, you get something smaller, you train again, you get something smaller again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you get this sort of decreasing sequence of, um, of training errors. Um, it might stabilize after a while, so you're not guaranteed to, to get to zero. Um, but in many, uh, for many models, you actually do get to zero eventually uh, for the trading error. This is not the uh, generalization error, but the training error is decreasing or at least non-increasing with K. So where did this sort of come from? Well, it's seems to be dating back to the early 90s, um, the work of Shapir in a paper called The Strength of Weak Learnability. And that was sort of addressing one of the open questions from the 80s of, you know, what can we do with all these um, fairly pathetic weak uh, models that we have flying around? And, and they started sort of, okay, well, actually, if you start collecting them and you start doing systematic training, such as boosting, um, you can you can get you can get a lot out of them actually, and then in in 2003, uh, Shapir and Freund wrote um, or defined a model called Adaboost, and this is in time uh, roughly around the time that Random Forest became very popular. So what what they did here is that they applied the boosting technique to binomial trees. Um, it's more to it than just the boosting algorithm I explained, but it's at the heart of it, it's, it's the sort of boosting algorithm. Um, and, and this became quickly became a very, very um, popular model to use. Um, sort of rival to the random forest in, in popularity and, uh, and uh, uh, performance. Um, a more modern example would be the light GBM. It's, um, I think it would, it, Again, the sort of paper typically comes out the year after, but it's some time around 2016 and 2017. It sort of came onto the machine learning stage. Um, and um, so back in my job in London, we would sometimes organize these uh, sort of one day machine learning competitions where you, you know, we have da some data set, uh, might be financial, might be, um, we did soccer, uh, soccer scores, uh, was, um, you know, football statistics once, etc. And then you just say, well, okay, you have three hours, build a model that predicts this one quantity as well as possible. And then we run an auto sample test and we see what team wins. And typically some variant of the light GBM would win. Uh, and I think the reason for that is that it is, it is a very simple model to, to use. And it, uh, it it is impressively uh, impressively uh, uh, good <laughs> at what it's doing. Um, okay. Well, how, what does this have to do with residual neural networks? Okay. So let's consider a shallow neural network. So by shallow, I mean one hidden layer. You have some input x. It maps through some weight function. Uh, some so frequency, I call these frequencies now, um, non-linear mapping and then final output weight. So that's it. One hidden layer. So this guy can then be boosted, right? So what do you get if you boost him? Well, you get some input layer, that's a shallow network, and then successively you build up um, new layers in this recursive fashion. So this is a residual network. It is not the same one as we saw before. You notice here that you have X here. So there's no nonlinear mapping of the previous layer. 
So in the previous um, equation I showed you, you had Z here, but now you just have X. So let's fix that and introduce a connection from the previous layer as well, um, which is, you know, fine. Um, then you get this, something that looks like this. Uh, okay. What is this? Well, the new layer is defined as the sum of the previous layer plus some nonlinear mapping of the previous layer plus some nonlinear mapping of the data. And the final layer is just the output of the network. Okay, so what does trading the shallow network? What does trading this shallow network amount to? Well, it amounts to solving this minimization problem. Now, if we think of the residual neural network as a boosted sequence of shallow networks, then it sort of makes sense now to define a layer by layer algorithm. If you recall how boosting worked, we said, well, let's just fix how we train the simple model, in this case, the shallow network. And then what we do for each new model, we just alter the input data by removing what we've already seen. So we can do the same here. So successively in each layer, for each new layer, you take away from Y what you've already detected in your network and then you optimize for, um, for this. Now, for a fixed layer L, if we fix the choice of frequencies, if we fix the choice of omega and omega prime, then actually what we have here is convex in C and V. So in practice, this implies that we can guarantee that the training error is decreasing for each new layer. Okay. Now, if you remember where we started, um, actually what we have then is sort of shown that at least for these types of um, residual networks, if you use this layer by layer method, you've avoided the degradation issue that I spoke about at the start. So the degradation issue people had prior to residual networks was that you, you couldn't train um, and observe a better training error, these really deep networks. The deeper they got, the worse the training error became. Actually what we have here is that the degradation issue is basically gone and we can just add layers so we can be guaranteed to have at least the same um, if not better training error. Okay, so let's return to the, um, the sort of continuous approximation of the residual network. And now I need to be a little bit more specific. And I'm following, uh, I'll just follow what, what we did in, in this paper. We have an archive called Smaller Generalization Error Derived for Deep Residual Neural Network. Um, so there we study a very specific residual network. We use trigonometric activation function. And we have an initial layer, which is just a shallow network. Um, so there are sort of technical reasons why we have this initial layer. Uh, it is not, so the point of this initial layer, which makes it first glance a little bit confusing is that we do not connect it with the other residual layers. Um, so then we define the residual network in a sort of standard fashion, except that we start off with zero. Um, and then the final output is the initial layer plus the output of the residual layer. So the residual layer here looks a lot like the um, 
residual network I had in the boosted residual network I just showed you. So you have in each layer, you have a connection to the previous layer plus a non-linear mapping of the previous layer plus the data, non-linear mapping of the data. The one difference to, to the boosted uh, shallow network is that I also have this initial layer. Now, this is my attempt at drawing a picture. Um, so data comes in, I've written alpha here, but this should be beta naught. So here we have a residual network, uh, sorry, here we have a shallow neural network. And then we get to the standard um, residual network bit. You see, you have these skip connections coming all the way through, but you also have a connection from X that goes all the way through the network. And then in the end, you take the sum of ZL and the output of the initial layer, and that's the output of the function. Okay, so this residual network is defined by the parameters, which I will shorthand um, denote by theta and theta prime. Now the standard approach would be to consider theta and theta primes just as solutions to this minimization problem, where I've now introduced here a regularization term. Um, but the, the point really um, to pay attention to is just that, okay, what do we have here? Well, we have a standard um, shallow neural network. So the, the sort of role of the initial layer is just to do, do the best it can uh, to approximate the output. I then remove that from Y and that is how I train my deep network. And then of course, subject to this recursive condition here. Um, but let's sort of in a similar fashion to, to Veinan Ö and, and his uh, co-workers, um, we use a sort of a random Fourier features approach here. That is, we let the, uh, the frequencies omega and omega prime be random variables. So we are slightly deviating from Veinan uh, in that he, um, for him, all parameters were random. For us, only the only the frequencies here of random variables. And why do we make that distinction? Well, oops. Let's fix the sample of omega and omega prime. Okay, so then the network is determined by the parameters B and C. Okay, if we have B and C, then we can just solve, well, we can try to solve this uh, optimization problem. Um, Similar constraints, of course. Just a small note, um, if you fix the frequencies, then again, you have a convex problem here. Okay, so we also want to sort of look at this as a discrete version of a continuous uh, problem. But for us, it's a sort of continuous time optimal control problem. And oh, just to rem uh, recall, recall now that um, y is equal to f plus f of e, f of x plus e, and f is the sort of unknown function that we're trying to reconstruct. So for us now, the b and the c are control Okay, so they, for, for Veinana, they were random variables, but for us, they're the controls. And we have a control function alpha, given a sort of the uh, continuous limit of, um, of this sort of recursive expression we had for the neural network. And what we do is that we formulate this problem as an optimal control problem with a time-dependent state function set and the dynamics given by, by alpha. And so it looks like this. So in some sense, very similar to how, how the neural network looked like, except everything is now integrals. And you have a, 
derivative instead of the uh, instead of the recursive relation. So now a nice a nice thing with this uh, optimal control problem is that it can actually be solved explicitly, and it has a, a it has sort of a simple expression, a simple solution, um, given by by this. And the uh, optimal path also has, a, has an explicit um, expression. So, so really, so you get the sense that this is actually an optimal control. The optimal control setting is quite nice because you have a fairly good um, sense of what's going on here. Um, you then sort of stumble into some fairly technical um, shenanigans and at the end of which you um, arrive at the following theorem. So if we assume that we have an optimal residual network uh, with the random frequencies as defined above, then under certain technical assumptions that I will not state here, um, you can actually bound the, uh, you can bound the generalization error in this way. Notice here that we have an expected value with respect to omega, um, because these are these are now random variables. But the leading term is really c divided by l k. Um, l again is the number of layers in the residual network, and k, I should have said that k is the number of um, um, nodes in each layer. And we can do more. We can we can say that actually, if you have the optimal densities for omega and omega prime, then you can find the minimum value of c, and it's given by this expression here. So b squared plus one plus log of a divided by b, where a is just the L1 norm of the Fourier transform of the hidden function f, and b is proportional to the L infinity norm of F. Okay, so why is this, why is this now interesting? Well, let's, so let's, let's, have, a, let's have a think. Okay, so first of all, uh, just to note that the term C divided by KL dominates provided that we're in a regime where um, you know, K is clearly bigger than L, but it's also dominated by LQ. So we're not looking at any of these sort of insane networks with just one node in each layer and thousands and thousands of layers. Um, now, if B divided by A is sufficiently small, then C, our constant here, is much less than A squared. And why is that interesting? Well. The generalization error of a random Fourier feature shallow neural network, so just one in the layer, can actually be bounded by S a squared divided by k. So for us now, for the deep network, provided that b divided by a is small enough, then actually c is much smaller than a squared, so that the leading constant here, or the leading term for the, for the estimate of the deep network is actually much smaller than for the shallow network. And is this ever true? Well, for instance, if you're looking at a function such as the sine integral, so some sort of regularized discontinuity, um, then you are in a sort of, you are in a, in a regime where the L infinity norm of F is much smaller than the L1 norm of the for your transform. So we can conclude that there are functions where the deep residual neural network has a more accurate estimate than the uh, shallow network. So I'm not going to go back all the slides, but if you remember where we started, we said that broadly there were two types of answers to why um, deep networks were big or better than 
shallow networks and, and sort of the first class was this like well actually it's much easier to train the deep networks and then you had some very sort of um, very famous results pointing uh, along those lines now this is sort of pointing the other way this is saying that well actually at least for some types of functions the deep networks do seem to be better at, at approximating them Um, okay, well, how do you then train these bad boys? Um, well, I think I sort of given you an outline already. Um, so we have this sort of layer by layer approach um, inspired by the boosting, looking at this network as a boosted network or shallow networks. But you still need to be able to train a shallow network. Well, luckily, we already done that. Uh, so in, a, in another paper uh, published uh, this year, we detail the metropolis algorithm um, that we now extend to these deep neural networks. Um, and, and actually we look at this as sort of a pre-training. And so you do the layer by layer training. And then when you're done with the layer by layer training, you run a standard global um, optimizer such as Adam. Okay, so what is the Metropolis algorithm? This is the algorithm in all its glory. Uh, so let me just highlight the important bits. You're given data, sorry, you're given data. And then in each step, what you want to do, what, I should have mentioned that, what you want to do is you want to sample from a distribution, you want to sample the frequencies. So the amplitudes are convex, easy to determine. You want to sample the frequencies from a distribution proportional to the Fourier transform of the hidden function, which you don't know. So therefore you have a metropolis scheme uh, or metropolis-like scheme where you, in each step, you generate some new candidate omega, omega prime here. And then this problem 57 is just a convex problem of finding amplitudes in a shallow network. So you calculate those. Um, and then you run through all your amplitudes and you check, uh, you look at the old amplitude and the new amplitude. And if the new amplitude is much bigger than the old amplitude, you're more likely to want to um, keep it. So that's the sort of gist of the algorithm. Um, you want to sample where the uh, amplitudes are big. Then the layer by layer algorithm is that you, you, you then apply this algorithm for each layer. And then you just remember that you need to train it on the residual instead of the standard data. So yeah, so the, the layer by layer, the, it's really happening here. So what you do, Okay, you have some data here, x comma r, you train, shallow network. You increase your uh, neural network with this new shallow network, and then you remove the output of the shallow network from y, and then you look back. Uh, and as I mentioned in practice, you can, when, once you've done the layer by layer training, you can improve your result further by running a global optimization run, um, sort of like Adam. So let me uh, conclude by just showing some numerical results. Um, now, we love the regularized discontinuity function. So that's the one we want to reconstruct. Um, so the target function here is a regularized discontinuity along one axis, and then it's just damped out with an exponential. Um, dimension will be fairly high. So dimension of X will be three in one case and 10 in the other. Um, we have three methods that we compare. Um, we want to just do the layer by layer algorithm. The method two here is really the sort of standard approach. Um, use Adam and use Xavier uh, initialization of all the weights. And then method three is the combined one where you first do layer by layer and then you do Adam. 
Okay, so first we just I just want to illustrate how well the effect of having a deep network compared to a shallow network. So here we are using method one. So that would be the um, just the layer by layer training. And the blue dots, we're trying to reconstruct this regularize this continuity. And we're in dimension three. The blue dots indicate the generalization error as the number of um, uh, units in the network grows. Um, and then the red one is the same, but with five layers. So we're keeping the sort of L times K constant. And well, you observe, I guess, that the slightly, the deeper network has a better approximation of, uh, ability than the shallow network. And then we move on to dimension 10 and we compare now the layer by layer followed by uh, Adam with the just Xavier initialization followed by Adam. Um, and really in dimension 10, Xavier plus Adam does fairly poorly. So this is what the reconstructed function looks like along the axis where the discontinuity sits. So the target function is in blue and the red line is a reconstructed function compared with the layer by layer uh, approach. Um, and this is a, a scatter plot where the target function is on the x-axis and the reconstructed um, values on the y-axis. You want everything to be along the line y equals to x. So the blue is the reference line. And you can see that for method three, so that would be layer by layer followed by uh, Adam. Um, the fit is, is clearly, clearly better. And the correlation uh, sees that as well. The correlation goes from 97% to 99.97%. Um, thank you for your time. <laughs>